This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. I was going to be doing a series on certain encyclicals and documents of the Magisterium because I think one of the biggest problems we have today is a general lack of familiarity with solid Catholic principles. And when people delve into exactly what the Magisterium, the dogmas, the popes teach, the true conclusions concerning Vatican II and other heresies that abound today become that much more clear. And so I want to talk specifically about the encyclical Morari Vos of Pope Gregory XVI. This encyclical was promulgated August 15, 1832, and it's on liberalism and religious indifferentism. And I want to cover some of the most interesting parts of this encyclical and how they contrast with the Vatican II apostasy and other heresies we see today. And I think when people look at the contrast, only one conclusion follows. And so, jumping right in, I want to first start in Morari Vos, Pope Gregory XVI's encyclical number 6. And I want to say that Pope Gregory XVI is one of the strongest popes, in my opinion, in the last few hundred years. He pulls no punches coming out against the heretics. He has some of the most memorable quotes denouncing evils that you will find of any pope. And in number six, under the section, evils must be deplored, Gregory the Sixteenth says that we must raise our voice and attempt all things, lest a wild boar from the woods should destroy the vineyard or wolves kill the flock. End quote. And so he's saying that he must come out and denounce these heresies because otherwise the flock might perish. And moving to number seven, he speaks about how a Catholic is to adhere to dogma. And this is a quote that I cited in my book, Outside the Catholic Church, There is Absolutely No Salvation, in the section dealing with how to understand Catholic dogma. And he cites Pope Agatho. Okay, so Gregory says... The admonition of Pope Agatho, nothing of the things appointed ought to be diminished, nothing changed, nothing added, but they must be preserved both as regards expression and meaning, end quote. That's very interesting because he's saying that the very expression of Catholic doctrine, okay, is critical. Just like Vatican I said, we must believe dogma as it is once declared, it's not a development we don't understand dogmatic pronouncements by fallible sources. We understand other things by the expressions of the dogmatic pronouncement. And another translation would say they must be preserved both as regards word and meaning. So the actual declarations of the words of the dogma are critical. That destroys modernistic novelties. I won't be able to cover every interesting quote in this encyclical but I will move as fast as I can. Jumping forward to point number 10, speaking of the church and papal authority, Gregory XVI says, Therefore it is obviously absurd and injurious to propose a certain restoration and regeneration for the church, as though necessary for her safety and growth, as if she could be considered subject to defect or obscuration or other misfortune. End quote. And he says this right after speaking about how the church is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so he's denouncing the false idea that the church needs a restoration or a regeneration. And this is actually an error of expression that many traditionalists use. They say we need the restoration of the church. That's actually not correct, as we see here. The church doesn't need to be restored because as long as it exists, even if it's reduced to a remnant, it doesn't require restoration. The concept of a restoration of the church itself implies that the church has an inherent defect. And this is also interesting because we see it contrasted with the heretical teaching of Vatican II. In Unitatis Redensa Gratio No. 6, Vatican II's heretical decree on ecumenism, it says this, Christ summons the church to continual reformation of which it is always in need, insofar as it is an institution of human beings here on earth." End quote. And so it says the church constantly needs reformation, whereas Gregory the Sixteenth denounces that idea because he says it implies that the church has a defect. And of course Vatican II 
and the anti-popes, which followed it, frequently spoke of the sins of the church, the defects of the church, etc. So this heretical teaching of Vatican II is in conformity with the modernist idea that the church is defective. And Vatican II also teaches that the church is insufficient as a means of salvation in ad gentes. Moving on to perhaps the most important quote in this encyclical, it comes in section number 13. Again, we're talking about Pope Gregory the Sixteenth Morari Vos. He's condemning indifferentism and the idea of salvation outside the church. And he says, Now we must consider another abundant source of the evils with which the church is afflicted at present, indifferentism. This perverse opinion is spread on all sides by the fraud of the wicked, who claim that it is possible to obtain the eternal salvation of the soul by the profession of any kind of religion, as long as morality is maintained. Surely in so clear a matter you will drive this deadly error far from the people committed to your care, with the admonition of the apostle that there is one God, one faith, one baptism. May those fear who contrive the notion that the safe harbor of salvation is open to persons of any religion whatever. They should consider the testimony of Christ himself, that those who are not with Christ are against him, and that they disperse unhappily who do not gather with him. Therefore, without a doubt, they will perish forever unless they hold the Catholic faith whole and inviolate. End quote. Now, there are some very interesting things to discuss here. He condemns the idea that souls can be saved in any kind of religion as long as morality is maintained. At first reading, someone may say, well, that's just condemning the idea that everyone is saved, a universalism, so to speak. No, it's not, because he goes on to affirm that you must hold without a doubt that whoever does not have the Catholic faith will perish. And he also says that those who do not gather with Christ will be dispersed unhappily or be lost. And so it's not just for those who reject him, as the modernists say, but if you are not incorporated into Christ and his church, you are lost. Furthermore, we see again, as we've pointed out in our debates, that there's only one baptism that the magisterium has not taught that there is salvation without baptism. It teaches one baptism over and over again, and that one baptism is of water, and we see it again in this encyclical, and he doesn't mention any exceptions. Additionally, it's important to consider that when he condemns the heresy, which holds that souls can be saved in any kind of religion as long as morality is maintained, he's condemning any idea that there can be any salvation outside the church whatsoever. Here's why. If someone, for instance, believes that a few Muslims can be saved, well, obviously, that person cannot logically limit the possibility of salvation without the Catholic faith to those Muslims. He would have to admit that if a few Muslims can be saved, well, then a few Buddhists might be able to be saved, or a few Jews, okay? Because once you break down the barrier of Catholic teaching, which declares no salvation without the actual Catholic faith, there is no barrier, and you have no criteria by which you can reasonably and justifiably limit it to those few Muslims. So once you admit any salvation for any soul in any other religion, you are therefore open to the idea of salvation in any religion whatsoever. Once you say a few Muslims, you must say that it's possible for also a few Jews, also a few Buddhists, also a few animists, etc. And that is precisely the wicked heresy, and Gregory the Sixteenth calls it wicked, and he calls the people who spread it wicked. That is the wicked heresy held by almost everyone who believes in baptism of desire today. And actually everyone, because even those who don't believe that support people who do. This papal teaching, of course, also contradicts Vatican II and the teaching of the Vatican II antipopes. For instance, in his encyclical Redemptoris Missio, 1990, Antipope John Paul II teaches that false religions are, quote, spiritual riches through which God makes himself present to other people. And he also says in the encyclical in number 10 that, quote, the universality of salvation means that it is granted not only to those who explicitly believe in Christ and have entered the church, end quote. That is directly contrary to what we just quoted from Merari Vos. Now, moving on, in the same paragraph, he continues, and again, this is paragraph 13 of Pope Gregory the Sixteenth's Merari Vos, August 15, 1832. And he's speaking of subjection to the See of Peter, and he says, quote, A schismatic flatters himself falsely 
if he asserts that he too has been washed in the waters of regeneration. Indeed, Augustine would reply to such a man, the branch has the same form when it has been cut off from the vine, but of what profit for it is the form if it does not live from the root? End quote. And so he's confirming again that the schismatics are outside the church, and that they flatter themselves if they assert that they have been washed in the waters of regeneration. This is interesting because one heretic who recently backed out of a debate we were going to do with him tried to refute some of the things we are saying by saying, well, schismatics and heretics have valid baptisms. He was referring to Protestants and Eastern, quote, Orthodox. He didn't call them heretics and schismatic. And he says, well, their valid baptisms give them some kind of union or standing in the church. He was saying this to try to justify Vatican II's heresy. And that, of course, is again directly contrary to what we read here.